Welcome to Suzanne's studio. I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host. And tonight I have two very accomplished, exciting people. My first guest is Dr. William F. Miller, who was the uh, vice president and former provost at Stanford University. Bill has had such an exciting life, half of it being in academia and half as a professional businessman. I could spend the whole rest of the time telling you about Bill Miller. However, we also have another gorgeous, fabulous young lady, Pat Devaney, who uh, formerly was the Associate Dean of Research at Stanford University. And not only that, but Pat received a very prestigious award that's only given to very special people who are either um, faculty or what are the other path? Staff or students? Staff, yeah. Anyway, it's called the Cuthbertson Award. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, welcome both of you. And tonight we're going to talk about Burma, which is also called Burma. Yeah, it's yeah. Bar -bar. Why, did, why did they change the name? Um, it was changed after, uh, during the British occupation, which was from the late 1800s until uh, 1957, 58, I believe. Uh, they, they called it Burma because that was the largest population and the dominant culture in Burma, so they called it Burma. Uh, and then after the independence, they wanted to be independent, so they called it Marabar, uh, and I don't know the origin of the term Marabar. But, but originally, it was a group of seven different countries and seven regions, and Burma happened to be the largest region. So in 1828, when the British occupied that whole area, they consolidated all those areas and states and they just called it all Burma. So there's still an ongoing war that's gone on more than 100 years in the northern states because they didn't want to be part of this country, and they're still fighting for their independence in two of the states up north. So Myanmar is, is a less um, loaded term than Burma is for the other states. Oh, I see. Now, why in the world? Well, Suzanne, first, I just yeah. want to say yeah. thank yeah. you for inviting us to oh, your studio. Oh, you're so welcome. Uh, because uh, I know that this provides so much information to this community, and it's a great service that you do. Thank so, you. And you're a wonderful interviewer. Oh, that, that makes thank it, you. That makes it easy for us. But I also just comment in the background, we see running some pictures, which were Pat's and my pictures that we took while we were visiting there. and. Uh, She's a good photographer, and I guess I'm a good photographer, not a great photographer, but they're good enough for, for the for the show. Well, I'm just so <laughs> pleased you're here, and Bill, I interviewed you a few months ago, and we talked about, we didn't talk about Burma, but I just want to tell the audience that in all my years' experience of interviewing, I don't think I have ever interviewed a person that has done all of the things that you've done, and you're still doing them. <laughs> I'm still going. <laughs> I know it, I know it. But I just want to ask you, why did you choose Burma? Well, it was the only Southeast Asian country that neither of us had visited before. Uh, we'd been all around it, you know, China, India, uh, Laos, uh, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, all that. Uh, the one, the other country close is Bangladesh. I've never been to Bangladesh, but we'd never been there before, and it was an interesting time to go there, so we decided to go. And we were there uh, last January, a year ago. Uh, we actually arrived before New Year's. Uh, we arrived in the I think on December 29th, but we spent the time there, so it was an interesting time to be there, and we were happy to do it. I, I, we've even talked about going back. Is that right, Pat? 
Would you like to go back also? I would, because when we got there, it was just about the time of an election, and it was the first free election they've had in 50 years. Um, and so the uh, party of um, the Liberal Party, that it was uh, headed up by Aung San Sui Kyi's, I can't say her name right, party, um, won. And so just now she's taken, her party has taken over, and, and we're hoping to see a lot of the uh, restrictions and the oppression lifted because of her uh, election, or her party's election. Um, she was the one who won the Nobel Peace Prize after 14 years oh, oh, of house arrest. Oh, oh really? Yeah. And as of yesterday, she has just taken over, right? Well, her party is. They her won't allow her to be president. She, yeah, but they, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start. Where do you want to start? Well. Um, I uh, might comment about why, why we did go, and I think I've said a little bit about that already, uh, because we anticipated it would be an interesting time, and it was a nice time of the year to go, incidentally, because some of the year they have these heavy monsoons, and oh my goodness, it, and it gets very hot. So we were there at a rather pleasant time, and we're able to arrange just our own private tour. We had a, a, a guide, our own guide, and we could go where we wanted. Uh, we would, uh, uh, she had in the morning or the evening before, she'd say, well, what do we want to do tomorrow? We can do this, that. She gave us a lot of ideas, but we didn't have to go along with a tour, uh, which was uh, really quite nice. So you got to meet a lot of the villagers? Yes, and, indeed. Yeah, what was that like? Well, that was one of the, for me, one of the more enjoyable parts because you can see a lot of pagodas. There are a lot of pagodas in the background pictures, but uh, uh, there are a lot of pagodas and stupas, and you see that. Uh, but uh, not often do you get to walk out in the villages. And so she would take, our guide would take us uh, out into the villages and we would talk to the people, see how they lived, uh, how they worked, what they were doing. And could they speak English? They could. Most people can because of the British rule from 1828 oh. to 1950-something. Yeah. So most people actually did speak English, to our surprise. What you were going to talk about, which I think was so interesting, Pat, the contrast. Yes, yeah, I, tell I, that's us about what I that. found most striking about Myanmar. Yeah, it's probably the most Buddhist country in the world, and you could really feel the tranquility and the the sweetness of the people. They have a lot of feral dogs and cats and lots of children who are in nunneries or monasteries, which I think are actually more like orphanages, but they have to beg for their food. You know, they all have to beg for the food. And people feed them all, and they seem to have great harmony among the whole society. And yet, they've been subject for the last 50 years to the most oppressive government. So um, I, don't, I just saw lots of contrast there, which I found really interesting. And Bill, you said something about the fact that the uh, the, the less the poor people still are cheerful, yeah. even though they know about the other people. And why would they be that way? Well, we we, we found that the people were very sweet people. They were cheerful. They liked to talk to us. They were inquisitive and so forth. I think they uh, were most um, uh, distressed about the uh, corruption, which is uh, extensive corruption, because the military owned a lot of things, and uh, so the corruption was something that they didn't make them happy. But generally, uh, they were not unhappy if one of the farmers got rich and so forth, because they felt that they could do that. Uh, there was some oppression of a, a group, of a small group, of ethnic, uh, uh, the Rohingya. Uh, the, the Rohingya live on the West Coast mostly, and they're, and they're Muslims. And almost all the rest of, uh, uh, with some exception, most of the rest of Myanmar is Burm, uh, was um, uh, uh, Buddhist. Up in the north, there are some Christians, and uh, because there are a lot of missionaries up there, and I believe they were Baptist missionaries. But uh, these uh, Buddhists, uh, belong to a, a sect of Buddhism called the Theravada Buddhism. There are two major sects, Theravada and the Mahayana, and they were the Theravada, and, and they're the most uh, 
I'd say aggressive. <laughs> and some places in South Asia, like in Sri Lanka, they're very aggressive. And so they were oppressing these Rohingya. And uh, a lot of them then uh, got on the boats and escaped to try to go to Thailand or to Malaysia to work. But uh, they were not considered citizens. Uh, they didn't get the vote and so forth. So there was that kind of oppression. We didn't see those people, but there was that kind of oppression. But by and large, the uh, Burmese that you would see were, were very sweet people. And I Googled, I, I Googled uh, Burma, and they said that Israel has given a lot of money to Burma. Yes, Is yes, there were, and a lot of a lot of countries gave aid. Uh, in, in particular, the U.S. did not for a long time, but then after uh, the Secretary Clinton was there, uh, she sort of began to open up a little bit, and uh, they, but the U.S. has been waiting for a higher degree of democracy and uh, less corruption. So talk more. Well, the corruption, a lot of it is about. Um, uh, the, the military selling off the rights to a lot of the natural resources, and I think Pat has a lot to say about oh, that in particular. Well, for example, jade is, you know, more jade is grown in Burma than anywhere, and they have 600 jade mines up in the northern states, uh, Shan and in the uh, Kachin, Kachin country, states, and uh, they have wonderful teak forests up there. In fact, Burma is a country with enormous natural resources, natural gas, um, and and all these jewels and, and minerals, but it doesn't benefit the people. It almost all gets uh, trafficked over to, smuggled over to China. And so China uh, controls most of these jade mines, and th that is right in an area called the Golden Triangle, which is where Burma and Laos and Thailand meet, <clears throat> and they grow more opium there than any other place in the world than, except Afghanistan. So they get these poor miners up in the northern states addicted to heroin, and that keeps them working in the mines. It shortens their life expectancy. It's almost a form of genocide, because they are the ones who are fighting for their independence from Myanmar. And so the central government seems to know this, but they don't care. So the military rule up to now have been the only people who have benefited from all this smuggling to China. And um, so I, that's part of the contrast of what you see because of the potential for the great resources they have to help the people in, in Burma. You really have a lot of information. Well, it was a fascinating—you know, it's yeah. one of those places that, once you're there, then you're really eager to learn more about it. And I probably learned more about it after we came home than I did before, but— How yeah. come that happened? Because— um, it was interesting. The guide was careful not to talk in front of her driver about anything against the government, but she said we could not go into any school. I mean, we couldn't go even drive through the university. We couldn't go into a hospital, which is just as well, because they have terrible health care. But the point is, tourists are very restricted. Um, we couldn't go into any military installation. Uh, and so um, we realized there was a lot we couldn't talk about. Uh, with our guide, and that made it, of course, more interesting, because we wanted to find out what it was. And you yeah. couldn't get it out of them? Well, if she went away— oh, she. Was if, she? If she went away from the driver, she was a little bit more open. But she was pretty careful. Yes, it was, they weren't clear who all was going to report them and who was not reporting them. And they were, uh, you know, there was always a little bit of suspicion of, uh, of uh, visitors or tourists. Uh, but we didn't feel any oppression from it ourselves. Uh, and it is opening up a lot, because before we went, uh, we were told that uh, only a citizen can have a cell phone service. Uh, but then, when we arrived, our cell phones worked. Uh, apparently, they had opened that up, and so I have an AT&T phone, and, and AT&T has a rate for Burma or for Myanmar, and so so that's opening up. It's uh, uh, fostering a lot of communication, and, and the communication is uh, pretty good there. Uh, one of the places that we visited was at one of the villages. We came upon a silversmith 
and he was working in his yard. Uh, the, his home was behind him, so his the home and his shop were the same. He invited us into um, his home, and uh, the family t spoke to us. Uh, some of them spoke a little English, but our guide would help us with that. But what we saw there was interesting. They had uh, uh, electricity, they had running water, they had uh, uh, a television, uh, they had the internet connection, and one of the young men there was studying his homework on the internet. So that kind of communication opens up the country. Oh, absolutely. and. Uh, when I think about it, but I'm not that well informed, I would think that it was all villages, no big buildings and, you know, fancy schmancy hotels. Oh, Wrong. oh, listen, there yeah. we were <laughs> on the airplane, this little rickety airplane, going from Mandalay to Inley Lake, and we drove over this teak forest, and it was like the most remote place I've probably ever been, and the plane was going like that, and I thought, you know, if we crashed here, nobody would find us for weeks, right? And we get there, and I see the most beautiful hotel I have ever seen, the Orium Resort and Spa, made out of teak, and it was just spectac spectacularly beautiful. So I, it was just another one of the contrasts that we saw there, you know, very high end and, you know. But, you know, psychologically speaking, I wonder, though, and I still can't get over what we were talking about, that here are these poor people who hardly have anything, and then they become familiarized with this, you know, uh, opulence. Well, you I mean, know, how they would they all, feel? They only have a 4 percent unemployment rate, which is actually That's better than ours. And oh. they— I think have a real sense of anticipation about the future. They're, they're not fatalistic about this is going to be it. They're very industrious people. They're happy, but they're still achievement-oriented. And I think they see that Sui Kay is going to really—she's just their savior, you know. They just believe she's going to help them so much. And I think that they have great hope that it is—and and I think it, they were already starting to feel it open up. So. Uh, didn't you get that feeling, Bill? Yes, I thought yeah. there, I thought there was a lot of anticipation, and and uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, the uh, they weren't jealous of a, a wealthy farmer uh, because they felt that that farmer, you know, worked hard and done that, and they had that opportunity themselves, and, and so they do have opportunity there. <laughs> but uh, you do see the contrast. Uh, uh, you see the poor villages, but you see some big, expensive, uh, very expensive. Homes. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, we saw uh, uh, villagers who were traveling in little horse carts, and uh, then at one of the hotels adjacent to it was a Mercedes uh, sales room. So, and somebody's buying those yeah. cars. So, how did those rich people get their money? It's the military yeah. that is oh. making deals with the Chinese. And oh. if you pa go past their homes, they're g behind gates, and one of them had a beautiful garden and a huge rock. You know, it was part of the kind of ornament yeah. in the in the garden, made of jade. I mean, it's the and we stayed in, in Rango, Yangon. It's called now. It used to be called Rangoon, and there was a wedding going on at the at the hotel. I mean, the opulence of it all was breathtaking. So. Yes, there is money there. And, uh, and they money. make a lot of money. Merchants made a lot of money. They, they, they had, uh, you know, on retail stores, big uh, new uh, 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 retail stores. Uh, the, of course, they made money on the airlines. So a lot of them, were citizens, made legitimate money. Uh, they probably had connections to the government which helped them, but it was a legitimate. So everything didn't come from the drug trade, although quite a bit of it has. Yeah. Of but uh, so uh, those, those were uh, opportunities for the ambitious ones and the better educated ones. And there's a big emphasis on education. They're desperate to get higher education, and I think that's the route to, to their advancement. Like Africa. Well, much like Africa yeah. in that regard. Yeah. But I think they're better educated in, in, in Myanmar, and I think they have better access to educational. Like, no matter how modest the hut was, it had a TV antenna. Um, and you saw lots of cell phones. And I really do think these people are uh, expect to achieve like all their Asian neighbors have. 
Do you think it has anything to do with the religion, like Buddhism? I mean... Well, well the, I, certainly the Buddhism helps give them the, the acceptance for what they have, but it, it's not like in India. You know, the caste system in some ways makes them fatalistic. That's just never going to change. Yeah. They don't feel that way there. They don't have the caste system in, in Myanmar, and they feel they can achieve. And, I mean, I think that's they are achieving. Yeah, I think that's so. a very good point. They don't, they don't feel that they're, uh, even though they're, they're various minorities, they don't feel like they're a subjugated minority. They don't like the military corruption and that, but, but they, and that is not a caste, there is not a caste system, strictly speaking. And so I think they feel that they can progress. Except for the state, northern states that still want their, they're still fighting for their independence. Yeah. There, there is discrimination and uh, there are some real issues. Which with states are those, Pat? The Sh Sean and Kachan, Kach, Kachin, 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 yeah. Kachin. They're up north in that Golden Triangle that area. Yeah. yeah, they're very close yeah. to the Chinese province of Yunnan. Uh, so right next to Yunnan province, and and the, so the Chinese influence there is very strong. And a lot of Chinese merchants came across and set up businesses and so forth, and a lot of tension. And uh, last year, I forget exactly what month that uh, was in the, I think in the fall. There is a serious military conflict between the uh, Myanmar military and the Chinese. Who are, uh, Chinese are coming across the border. Uh, it, it didn't last long, but there's a lot of tension right there. The, there was a huge um, hydroelectric dam that was going to be built near the China border. That's where all the smuggling was going back and forth with the teak wood and stuff. And the people of Myanmar protested, and they said, you know, that's going to we're going to have to relocate thousands of people in the villages, and we're going to lose our water supply if you have that dam. And there was such protest that the Myanmar's government, Burmese government, actually halted the project, which had really angered the Chinese, because they wanted—they expected to get all that electricity. They did—none of it was going to go to the, to the poor people of, of uh, Burma, only 24 percent of whom even have electricity. But um, so now there are some tensions between Myanmar and China, because they're going to put a stop to some of this exploitation, we hope. But, you know, all of this, it, the world is getting so much smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and they are so much more obvious and conspicuous than they used to be, because nobody paid attention to them before. Right. Because when people talk about places like Burma, you know, nobody goes there except you. Uh, you're so adventuresome, the both of you. Where's your next trip? We, um, uh, are th we were planning, we haven't organized it yet, to go to Bali in the uh, late... Uh, now you're talking. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we just have a couple of minutes left. Pat, what did you buy there? That's what I'm interested in, shopping. <laughs> of <laughs> course, of course. Um, I bought little jade trinkets. Uh, not knowing that people were dying in the mines for these things, but they, we went to this gem museum where they had a, a incredible, beautiful jade, and I learned all about the different qualities of jade and what makes it valuable and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, in the little street vendors, they had lots of little jade, little necklaces and keychains and stuff. Yeah. So I bought some of that stuff. I thought on the show, because I heard about Jade, that you were going to be just dripping with Jade all <laughs> well, over. Well, you know, I would have, because I bought lots of Jade before I went, but then yeah. I found out how the people suffer to get it, that oh. kind of it makes me, you know, like it a little bit less. Yeah. It's like, it's like becoming ivory. a vegetarian, yeah. you know, when you think about the animals, yeah. right? Well, I, I bought a whole Burmese outfit. I had the the, uh, the uh, longi, which is a, the kind of the long skirt that you yeah, and then a, a shirt that you wear over it. I, I was tempted to wear it tonight. Oh, but I, I didn't. wish you had. <laughs> we'll, we'll do another show. I think that one of those pictures on there is a picture of him in it. No, they, they, they show me in it. Yeah. 
What a wonderful trip. It's so fabulous for me to know people like you because I get these vicarious emotions <laughs> and feelings, really, because it's so hard to travel. It's a wonderful yeah. place. It would be great to go. You would love it. Oh, and I it would. Has a, you know, it has a quite interesting uh, history. Um, the settlements there uh, were long before Christ. I mean, there was uh, early settlements there, and it, 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 it's a civilization built, uh, grew up there, somewhat isolated, but uh, it's close to the tie and, and so forth. And at one time, uh, they had a very strong military that uh, they they were. Uh, uh, invaded Thailand and occupied a large part of Thailand. Uh, the, when I had visited Thailand, they used to talk about the bad Burmese who had been <laughs> occupying there. So, so it was quite an interesting history. And there are more than a million pagodas, literally. A million? A million. That's what they said. Pagodas. Mm -hmm. Every place you go, you just the hillside is lined with pagodas of all sizes. It's like a, it's another world, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, we have come to the end. I want to thank both of you so much. It's such a pleasure this has been to fun. interview people like you. Both. Thank you, Suzanne. And well, I wish you well. And of course, Bill and I live in the same place, so we can we can uh, keep up on Pat. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for inviting us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I do want to thank our crew. I always, am, I, you know, talk about being grateful. This could not happen without our crew, and and we we are all. Uh, Oh, what volunteers? Not I mean, there are a few people here that aren't, but my crew are volunteers, and they're so talented and good-looking and darling, and <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank my audience for watching because we we couldn't do this without you either, and you know what? I always say this, and I mean it from my heart. I can't wait to see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>